I'm asking that you turn with me to the book of Isaiah at chapter 40. Nobody will chew gum in God's house. Youngsters do not move around. They do not make notes. Everybody is in perfect order. This is the house of God. Amen. In a moment, I want us to study for our first scripture tonight from the 40th chapter of Isaiah. But while you've turned to it, hold it there before you, I hope you will. Let me say that tonight I want to try to speak on the gospel of the glory of God. There isn't any other gospel, but for the most part, this generation, people in America have never heard the gospel. I'm not saying that of you. If you have heard the gospel, it would seem to me that you'd be better soul winners than you're acting like these first few days with you. If you've ever heard the gospel, there's a tremendous responsibility on you. Pass it on to somebody else. But I'm looking you in the face and telling you that I'm preaching in a generation of people in America, the great majority of them, that attend their churches every time the doors are open and never hear anything that smells like the gospel. And I want to speak tonight largely to enable those of you who know the Lord. I don't know who you are. It is a solemn thing that nobody on God's earth but you knows whether you're a Christian or not. You know, the Bible condemns anybody who thinks he's smart enough to tell whether a man's a Christian or not. Nobody but you and God know whether you're a child of God or not. That's all. I can't tell. I could pass the judgment, but I'd be sinning. The Scriptures do not say that another human being can tell whether another human being is a Christian or not. You know, that's pretty solemn. That means that if you're not interested in the matter, you're in pretty bad shape. Because it's between you and God. No human being can tell whether another is a child of God. Did you have thought about that? And so I don't know. I don't know. But I want you to help. I, 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 I just bet you there's some Christians here tonight. I wouldn't know which ones they are. I'm not God. But surely there's bound to be somebody here tonight that by faith in Jesus Christ is one of God's dear children. How many I do not know. And I want you to understand. They say I'm different. I do the best I can. I do not ask you to agree with me. I ask you to hear me. The most humbling and at the same time most challenging thing that has ever faced me as a ruined child of Adam. I believe I've been rescued by a sovereign God and saved by his marvelous grace. If I've never been saved, I hope I'll find out that I've missed Christ. Time to start screaming for mercy. I don't want to go to hell. Hell will be full of preachers, I expect, that can beat me preaching. The fact that I'm a preacher, of course, is not the slightest evidence that Jesus Christ dwells in me and I in him. But I'm challenged 
and at the same time humble. By scripture, don't turn to it, we'll turn to it in a moment. Found in 1 Timothy chapter 1, we'll turn to it in a moment, verse 11. Where the Apostle Paul says, according to the gospel of the glory of God, this is what humbles me, which was committed to my trust. Paul said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Just old flesh. And Almighty God has entrusted the spreading and the proclamation of the gospel of the glory of God to people like us. Brother, that's the most humbling thing I've ever faced. I come again to tell you that if I speak tonight to one of God's dear children, as far as in you is, you're responsible for the proclamation of the gospel of the glory of God. God help if with all your might and name, with every bit of the strength and brains and heart and tears and everything about you, if you're not giving yourself as the main thing in your life, the proclamation was spreading around the world in every way possible this glorious gospel that almighty God didn't give to angels he entrusted it with us and the great concern of my heart I mean this is that our generation We'll not live in any other. What witness we give will be in this generation only. Until the last time. The great concern of my heart is that our generation may experience an evangelical awakening. That simply means a gospel awake. I say to you that this generation of men and women inside of our churches is absolutely asleep as to what the gospel of our salvation really is. And I want to return to the message used of God. The only message God's ever used. And he has used it in other days. Baptists used to preach it. They don't now, but they used to. Your daddy preached it. Your mother and father heard it. But with few exceptions, this generation is utterly asleep. Never heard the gospel. Therefore, they can't be saved, because you can't be saved apart from hearing and believing the gospel. The gospel that God has used in other days, the message that God has used in other days to awaken people to a sense of their own need and to the beauty and the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Jonathan Edwards preached it and God gave him a revival that shook him up. McShane preached it and God gave a revival that shook Scotland. 
Luther preached it and God gave a revival that shook the world. Calvin preached it and is still the most hated man that Catholics, they hate him worse than they hate the devil. John the Baptist preached it and prepared the people to receive the Lord Jesus Christ when he came. It's the twofold message of evangelism. The one biggest, not the only, but the one big ministry of a Christian congregation. The one primary reason for the existence of the Draper Valley Baptist Church, I think you call it, is to proclaim, not simply in this book, but through the lips of every member of this church as you meet people, the twofold message of evangelism. And it's simply this, all flesh will come to know the whole your God. Everything man does is going down in the dust. There's never been but one hope. It's the hope today. Get men and women to lose all confidence in what they can do. Lift up their eyes and behold God. You don't believe that. If you did these prayer rooms, it'd be full. You think you can have the blessing of God without prayer, but you can't do it. You can't do it. It's the message which takes away the glory of man and proclaims the glory of God. And I want to see, and so help me God, in my blundering way. I was taught the gospel in Southwestern Theological Seminary. From 1928 to 30, I was a student I haven't changed the word of my message since. Those old professors taught us boys the gospel of the glory of God. For these thirty odd years I've been stumbling and bumbling trying to preach. It's just to kill the flesh and look at God. And I want to return to Bible preaching. The pastor asked me today if I believe we'd see revival in our day. We will if we can have some Bible preaching and some prayer. God will grant revival. That's the only two weapons we've got, and we've been doing it out, both of them, for a long time. And we're in the holy mess system. Our churches are going through the motions, and we're not getting anywhere. Most of our converts don't stay converted but about six weeks. Am I lying to you? And I charge tonight with a bleeding heart that if you have a church here where the Sunday school teachers and the pastor preaches a message that kills everything about the flesh and leaves men with nothing to trust in, and points them to God and say he's the only hope. 
You're the biggest devils out of hell. If you don't spread that all over this valley. Brother, if God entrusts you with something and gives you the privilege of hearing the gospel one time, you're in debt to him for the rest of your life, and so help me, God, you dead fundamentalists quit bragging about what you, about being so right. And get some shoe leather and wear it out and learn how to weep over sinners and stand between this valley and the ravages of a holy God with the gospel of the glory of God. I'm after fundamentalists. I'm one of them. We're the deadest people out of hell. We're so proud we're right on some things. We like to cuss the modernists. They ain't doing half as much damage as we are by our deadness and our prayerlessness and our fact that we can't weep over sinners. Don't love the souls for whom Christ died. Time for us to come to the mourner's bench. For I tell you, I know what will happen. And I long to see it. I've seen a taste of it, and I know we can see God splitting this valley wide open if he could build one church in this great valley. But they quit bragging about their right on the second coming and right on the last days and believe in the verbal inspiration of the Scripture. All of those good things, but they're not the main thing. The main thing is to preach the cross. Please, God, by the preaching of the cross to save them that believe. And the cross just has two messages. It kills the flesh. It hymns every man up with God's holy law and leaves us guilty without a leg to stand on. Then it points to a bloody Savior hanging on a cross. He's now sitting on the throne. He says to men and women, there's life in a look. But it's got to be not at yourself. It's a God in his son who hung on a cross. And now he sat down at the right hand of God forever. The enthroned Christ. That's the message. That's the message. I will give you a dime if you're right on your details of the second coming. If you're sitting around and not preaching the cross to men and women as you're facing. Amen. For out of this kind of preaching backed up with the brine and the salt of intercessory prayer for you listen to our farmers. No sinner yet has ever been saved apart from the intercessory prayer of God's people. If you want people saved, you know how to get it done. This church can't meet together and spill its tears on this nice floor and cry out to God for the work of the Holy Spirit to open the hearts of dead sinners and call them Bring them to seeking Christ. You ought to close it up and quit disgracing the name of Jesus Christ. There's nothing on God's earth that smells as bad as a prayerless, fundamental church. Tell him the truth. For out of a return to the proclamation of a message that puts man down in the dust and God on a throne, Backed up by the salt of intercessory prayer. I'll tell you what will happen. It will result in deep conviction coming on some. Not all, but some. They are born, will be born into the kingdom of God. Ladies and gentlemen, you better listen to me. Only the Holy Spirit can produce the new birth. You can't. I can. You can talk about how many people you won to Jesus till you blew in the face. You never won a soul to Jesus. The Holy Spirit's the soul. Oh, 
jobs to witness, your jobs to preach, your jobs to pray, your jobs to live, as far as you can go, brother. God, the Holy Spirit, is the one who gives birth. Amen. I wish we believed. Men, under the gospel of the glory of God, takes away everything from man, promotes God, exalts God, gets men to this place that they have a sense of the awful presence of God brooding over the hearts of men. That will result in the foundations of the great deep of men's hearts being broken up. Gone will be the voice of the sinner who inwardly debates whether or not he'll patronize the Son of God. I hear that till I nearly want to die. Sin, Christ is knocking at my heart's door. Shall I let him in? Or shall I bid him depart forever? Isn't that blasphemy? As if you could let him in or drive him away. Instead, we'll get back to preaching the gospel. We'll see what it is in a minute. And back it up with prayer. That's all you got. Your tricks and your plans and your schemes, they worth a dime. God's got two weapons given to us. I'll tell you what we'll go to here. We'll hear the heart warm and sob from people. Depth of mercy. Can there be mercy still reserved for me? Can my God his wrath forbear me? The chief of sinners. That's Bible talk. That's where men get to when God saves them. Not saying whether I'm going to accept Jesus or not, but standing in holy awe. Can there be mercy for such as me? Can my God his wrath forbear me, the chief of sinners, spare. Translated into what the kids who were not paying a bit of attention to me might could understand. That mean would change the team. And sinners saying, no, I, I, I don't believe I'll take Jesus today. I'm going to sometime. You heard him talk that way. Blasphemers. Must have been listening to you with your false witness. Whoever asked him to do such a fool thing? But to be sinners in this valley come to you and you say, Do you reckon God would save me? Me? Would you pray that God would show mercy to me? Now, brother, that's Bible. That's how God saves sinners. He brings them to that place. And I call you the witness that's been 40 or 50 years in the most part since we've had much of that in this country. We've had them doing what they were. I just don't know what it means. Ain't nothing like it in the Bible. <laughs> and I hear him talking about accepting Jesus as my personal Savior. And I wonder what on God's earth that means. That ain't in the Bible either. Now hold on to your hands. I'm going to show you tonight there ain't no such animal as Jesus, a personal Savior. 
That's not the Christ of the Bible. You hold on to your hat. I'm pleading with you fundamentalists. Come down off your cocky high horse. Of course, you got a few little truths. And go to preach in the gospel that'll get glory to God. That's the only kind there is. And whittle sinners down to whether they go to screaming for mercy instead of deciding whether they'll accept or reject Jesus Christ. God Almighty never gave the sinner the option of accepting or rejecting his son. He just gave him the option of when. Every sinner that ever breathes God's air is going to accept, if you want to use that word, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just a question of when, but you can accept him. If you want that term, it's not a Bible word. The Bible word receive him. That means submit to him. Now, and he'll save you. You can reject him now, and he'll drag you out of hell and make you bow your knee and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the one we've been saying is all the time. L-O-R-D, Lord! I'm quoting scripture. Not for damn, not for salvation. Too late for that, but thank God. Not too late for damn, but for the glory of God. Second chapter, Philip. You can put it down, brother. You don't have the privilege of accepting or rejecting Jesus. You're going to accept it. You do have the privilege of rejecting him now. But he'll make you bow to him one of these days. That's right. That's right. Now, but ladies and gentlemen, would the Draper Valley Baptist Church like to get in on the rising tide? It's still small, but it's coming. The glory of God's people is yet future. Jonathan Edwards, the greatest preacher America ever produced, the only man God's ever used, to bring real revival to America. That's right. Finney and Moody just came in on the tail end before the Jonathan and Edward revivals died. God just used one man so far in America to bring revival, Jonathan and Edward. Jonathan and Edward said, the task of every generation of God's people, listen to this now, is to discover the direction in which the sovereign redeemer is moving in his day and then move in that direction. You can't get anywhere with a message and a method that is contrary to the word of God. You can't get anywhere with a message or a method that is not exalting and enthroned Christ Instead of this silly little Jesus they preached for 40 to 50 years. Now we're ready for our text. Isaiah chapter 40. You got your Bible there? Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for her sins. The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. This is a prediction of the ministry of John the Baptist. And it's interesting to note that the one who does the crying is Almighty God. He just used the voice. Rock Barnard doesn't command men to repent. God does through my voice. Rock Barnard doesn't command men to receive Jesus Christ in throne. Them. God does. He sometimes uses my voice or yours. We're just the voice. Thank God we're the voice. But open your mouth and go to spout God's message. 
The voice of one that cries in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. That's God's message. Make straight in the desert a highway of our God. Every valley shall be exalted. And every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight. And the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord that this generation's never heard about nor seen shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together that glorious time's coming. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it, that settles it. The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass. And all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth. Everything the flesh, that's you and me, everything we do, is going to wither. Amen. The flesh, how much does it profit? A little bit. Jesus says the flesh profited how much? M-O-T-H-I-N-G, nothing! The grass withereth, the fire flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. O Zion, that bringeth good tidings, get thee up to the high mountains. O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up and be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Be whole your God. That's the message. The message that kills. Every activity and hope and expectation of the flesh, that's us, just points men to God. He's the only hope. He's the only hope. If God doesn't kill your flesh and all your confidence in it, he's going to have to send you to hell. You'll never... Look to God. As long as you think you can do it yourself. A congregation, unless God can kill all of your expectations, that any of your activity, your beautiful building, your lovely pastor, everything you do, if you got the least bit of confidence in it, God will never bless you. You got to die to all confidence in anything men can do. Just have confidence in him. That's right. And for a church, that's true. And for a sinner, that's true. As long as there's a wiggle of self-effort on the part of a sinner, God will never save him. You've got to get the whole wiggle out and bring a man the way he throws up his hands. Plead guilty! and cast himself on the mercy of God. That's all my hope God can do with me as he pleases. But I sure can't do nothing myself. Lord, I'm on your hands. You get in that shape, God will do something. And the church, God will bless it. They get in that shape. Amen. I bet you when you started out here, you didn't depend so much on what you did. You prayed more, didn't you? You better get back to it. Cut out claiming to be Christian, amen? That's right. I'll be gone a little while. you got to live here. The responsibility for this valley is on you. Amen? Your pastor tells me there ain't much gospel around here. But if he's telling me the truth, and you folks know it, you say you do, well, you better get the spread, it, brother. Your budget ought to go up about ten times more than it is now in a week's time. And if you believe what you say, you do it. Brother. You need money to spread this gospel. That's right. Any Christian that's satisfied with the giving of tithe is a disgrace. 
I'm looking you in the face. If you can sleep at night when all you do is give one tenth of your income, you are just great. That's what you are. You don't believe what you say you do. Why, the old unsaved man has to tithe. Because the tithe belongs to the Lord, whether you're saved or not. But the Christian is to be a hilarious giver. Isn't that what Scripture says? Why, your budget would go up $10 to one if we had some Christians around here that had been entrusted with the gospel of the glory of God. And says, here's a whole man going to hell. God's given us this gospel, and we're going to get it out. By radio and every other way under God shining sun. You going to shoot me? Talking to you. I don't want nothing you got, but when I meet you to judge me, I talk to you. I wasn't mad at you, but I looked you in the face and talked to you. This generation not acquainted with the God of the Bible. Nobody's ever told them about the God of the Bible. We preached a little helpless God. But the God who doeth as he pleases in the heavens, and no man can give him counsel. He cannot be added to. That God who created an earth for one simple purpose that on it he displayed the glory of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as it hangs on a bloody cross. That God this generation don't know nothing about. We've magnified man and not God. We preach the so called gospel that glorifies man. And takes the glory away from God. The most blasphemous thing I've ever attended in my life is a testimony meeting in the average Baptist church. The people brag on themselves until if God won a God of mercy, he burned the whole outfit up and sent them to hell. Nobody bragging on God. And when they do get around to the Lord a little bit, they thank him the Lord for what he's done for them, proving they wouldn't know him if they met him in the road. Because unless you love him for what he is, not what he's done for you, you're not saved. He's altogether lovely. The Bible doesn't say seek what the Lord can do for you. It says seek the Lord. The Lord. The Lord doesn't give you something, he gives you himself. And I look you in the face and tell you, it's been a long time since anybody's just bragged on the Lord for the beauty of him, for the glory of him. Oh, we had churches full of people that could see God's glory. In that bloody man hanging on a cross, that's God's glory. And if we could see him now, sitting on a throne, the enthroned Christ, and all the power to transform lives and make men holy, flows from the hands of him who's not standing outside your heart door waiting for you to let him in. He's sitting on a throne of God forever. And God Almighty has turned the destiny of every human being into his hands. He bought you on the cross and he's going to save you or damn you one or the other. He's got to do something with you. Because you belong to him. Behold your God. Blood is God on the cross and enthroned Christ sitting on the throne. This little Jesus that you can accept as your personal Savior 
wouldn't do you any good if you did. But oh, this enthroned Jesus Christ. God's prophet to bring God's truth to you and kid you. God's priest to hang on a cross, pay for your sin. God's priest sitting at the right hand of God now making intercession for his people. You couldn't say, stay saved five seconds. It wasn't for him there at the right hand of God making intercession for you. And God's Lord, not by your consent, by God Almighty's decree, the Lord of every man. That's the Jesus I preach. Not Jesus' personal Savior. He's never offered as such. But Jesus has got the Son and the only begotten Son to be a teacher. To be a sacrifice and substitute. And be the dictator of your life. That's the Christ of the Bible. It's my charge that we preach one half of one third of Christ for two generations. We preach the priestly work of Christ on the cross. Don't hear much about what he's doing now, praying at the right hand of God. That's one third of Christ, isn't it? His priestly work, dying on the cross and interceding in glory. But there's two more parts to Christ. He's God's prophet to kill you with his flesh-killing demands. Make you lose all confidence in yourself and drive you to him. And he's God's Lord to rule in your life. You can't have any Jesus except that one. If you do, he's the product of your imagination. No one you accepted him as your personal savior and still live like hell. You've never met the Christ of the gospel. That's right, folks. What is the gospel? It's all about Christ. Who's Christ? Where ye are in Christ Jesus, who has been made of the Father, of him, made unto us what? Wisdom! Righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. All that God has for men is in his Son. Not the Jesus whom you say you accepted as your personal Savior, but the one who came to teach, to die, and to rule. That Jesus, that's the Jesus of the Bible. See it? That one. Is God's gift to sinful men. Do you know him? Is that the one? Did you receive somebody to be the absolute master of your life? Did you? Does he rule in your life every day? Do you take every decision to him? Is the chief thing about you the will of God. I want to do what pleases God. Put it down, brother. This generation of Baptists can go all day long and never crack the Bible and call themselves Christian. I said, God's truth. He say, I'm saved. Most Baptists today never crack the lids of the Bible for a week at a time. Oh, yes, I'm saved. I wonder what in God's name you say from. You wouldn't know no about Jesus if you met him in the road. You couldn't live a day without feeding on his precious word if you are saved. That's right, bud. That's right. Now will you turn to my text? The sermon is nearly over, but we're just now getting to the text. And give him a heart tonight. I want to see us get back to preaching Christ. Huh? The whole Christ. Amen. Where is he now? He sat down at the right hand of God on the throne. 
Isn't that right? He went from a bloody cross by way of a grave. But God had highly exalted him. When he went back there having purged us from our sins, he sat there. And that's where he is now. That's the Christ I'm preaching. He enthroned Christ, the Lord of all men, the absolute master, the one who has your destiny in his hands. Be the Savior, damn you, one or the other. That's the Christ in preaching. And the Apostle Paul makes this tremendous statement. In chapter 1 of Timothy, 1 Timothy, according to the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer. That's his testimony. Bragging on himself, isn't he? I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy. I obtained mercy. You say you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, whatever that means. Paul said, I obtained mercy. There's a whole lot of difference. A whole lot of difference. A whole lot of difference. The proclamation of the glory of God will make some people seek the mercy of God. The proclamation of the gospel we've had in America for 40 years will get men to make up their minds, which they're going from one job to other, and say, I accept Jesus as my Savior, and go on out the same old hog pen, live all the days of their life, and the same old hog pen the Benny and call himself Christian. But, brother, a man who hears the gospel that brings glory to God, none to man. Some of them become a seeker after the mercy of that God. Knowing that God owes salvation to no man and he doesn't have to show mercy to any man. That if he does show mercy, it'll be out of the goodness of his own heart. And if you ever get saved, you'll never get over it. For you'll never get over wondering how God could save such a devil as you are. That's right. In the book of Exodus, at the 33rd chapter, we have the first time the glory of God is mentioned in the Bible. And we have to turn there to find out what the gospel of the glory of God that was committed to our trust is. And I'm going to take the time, ask you to turn to it, because I'm preaching to this congregation. You're hemmed up here, and you can't get nobody to come with you, I guess. And you're going to have to break out of this, and when you break out, I want you to have something to say, as you never said it before. And I'm going to tell you that if you go to spreading the gospel of the glory of God, all over this valley. A lot of folks are going to get mad at you, but some people are going to get saved. If you go to stripping sinners and they'll fight you, won't they? But they've got to be stripped plumb naked or they'll never call on God. Do you believe that? That's the God's truth. Now, the glory of God, what is it? In the 18th verse of the 33rd chapter of, of, of Exodus, you got it? Moses asked God a question. It's the most tremendous question I ever heard of a man asking God. Moses said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Would you love to see God's glory? Huh? About all we've had, I mean, we had in Sunday school, and I love the Lord all my heart. Won't you pray for him? I hold out faithful to the end. And I gave a tithe of my money, and I invited somebody to Sunday school, and all that sassafras. But would you love to see the glory of God? Huh? All right. God says, all right, Moses. And God had it put down here in the Bible so we could look at it tonight. 
Would you love to see the glory of God? Huh? All right. God says, verse 19, says, Okay, Moses, I'm going to show you my glory. It's got three parts. First, here's my glory. I'll make all my goodness pass before you. You stand there and watch now. I'm going to make all my goodness, not yours, sister, but his. See, you ain't got none. That old flesh of yours stinks, it's putrid, it's rotten. But I, God said, I'm going to show my goodness, amen, before thee. Second, I'll proclaim the name of the Lord, of the Jehovah who hung on a cross. Not this little, nice little Jesus you trying to get, let him in your heart. Well, if he's that little, he wouldn't do you no good. Get it? I'll proclaim. That's what I want this church to go to do it. Just fill this valley with the name. The name means authority. The one who's on a throne. The one whom God's turned over everything. All authority is given unto me, said Christ, didn't it? Well, in heaven and earth, didn't it? We'll go to preaching that kind of a Jesus. Brother Riggs, I bet you was raised on this. Huh? You old enough. These young, young folks ain't got no sense. But, huh? That's right. I'll proclaim it. I'll proclaim it. Won't you let Jesus save you? No, not none of that blasphemy. I'll proclaim the name of the Lord. Bless God, he holds this world together. Reading the stars don't smash up. He sustains it by his W-O-R-D word. He speaks and dead men rise from the grave. He speaks and life comes to dead sinners. I'll proclaim his name. This generation hadn't heard about this Jesus. I'm telling you the truth, folks. And third, I'm showing you my glory now. And I will be gracious to everybody. Now who? I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. God says, I'm going to show you my glory. Here it is. I'll call my goodness to pass before you. I'll proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus. And I'll show grace to whom I will. And I'll show mercy to whom I will. Now that's how God gets glory. This is the gospel. Now read the rest of it. God said, Moses, you can't see my face, for the man, no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, that I'll put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. Then I'll take away mine hand, and as I pass by, thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. You couldn't take it if God manifested his full glory to you. Wouldn't you love to see it as a sort of passes by? We can see that in our day. If we'll go to preaching the gospel, of the glory of God. What is it? His goodness. His Son. Not this little teeny weeny Jesus, but the enthroned Lord. And if we'll stand up and tell this generation of sinners that while God must do right, he don't have to show mercy, and he exercises the right, 
to have mercy on whom he will. He don't have to show mercy on you. He don't. You can't make him. All on God's earth you can do, get you a club and try to kill him. Or come down off your high horse and kneel at the cross and say, Oh God, if thou wilt, thou canst make me whole. Who knows? He might say, I will. Go thy way. Be thy hope. How precious it is with this sort of a background. And I insist that this is the way God gets glory to himself. And I insist that any gospel that doesn't magnify the fact of the enthroned Christ and the sovereignty of God in saving whom he pleases. I insist that if that isn't in your message, it is not the gospel. And if we could get men and women to face this, somebody would like to hear us. When we open the Bible, we shut them up to the fact that if they're going to have any contact with Christ, they're going to have to bow to him because he's on a throne. It's not a matter of you accepting him, brother. It's a matter of you bowing to him. That's where he is on a throne. You bow to somebody's on a throne. Isn't that right? And if we'd have the courage to go to preaching the gospel instead of this stuff we've called it. All of America, you say you believe it. All right, get out and go to preaching. Amen. All right. I know your pastor does. Get out and go to preaching. Amen. And then when you got the old sinner saying, well, I guess I'll just have to go to hell. God show mercy to whom he will. And I sure wish he'd show mercy to me. Then you can turn and read. And you, as he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin, who, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power there, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our manner of living in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others but God who is rich in mercy. Ooh, he got plenty. It wouldn't exhaust the bank if he showed mercy to you. Huh? What happened? Well, bless God, we just wallowed knee deep in the lust of our flesh, and the devil had a ring and our nose just leading us around our ruin. You know what happened? God. But God. Who is rich in mercy? For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins and couldn't do a thing about it, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, as you see, and hath raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might, S-H-E-W, show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ah, oh, he's rich in mercy. Of course, you don't need mercy. And you ain't fixing to call on him for mercy. You don't accept Jesus as you saved and go on to hell. But if you ever feel the need of mercy, I've got news new for you. He's rich. Just any other. And then, isn't it wonderful to read in Romans 12 and 10, 10 and 12, where God says, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all who call upon him. Boy, that's good. Of course, 
you're not interested in calling on it. Well, I ain't talking to you, but if you ever get to the place you'd like to be saved, and you don't figure you can save yourself, he's rich toward a double L all. Isn't that wonderful? Who called upon him? Amen? Because nobody needs mercy. That's the reason not calling on him. Isn't that right? But nobody much in this generation has ever been preached to that they need mercy. We just said, wouldn't you please accept Jesus as your Savior, whatever that means. Huh? We haven't preached this enthroned Christ that shows mercy to whom he will. Huh? That has your destiny in his hands and can save your dad. Huh? And while he has to do right, he don't have to show mercy. He don't owe you a dime. Huh? And if we fill this valley with that, some folks would get awful mad. But some folks would say, hey, do you reckon he'd have mercy on me?